Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Theory Seminar. This week, Guillermo Bonasso, he's going to tell us the maximal determinants problems and generalizations. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to the seminar. Uh, as Tina said, I'm going to talk to you about the maximal determinant problem and some generalizations of it. So uh, let's start with Hadamard's determinant bound which says uh, that if you have a square matrix of order n with entries taken from the complex unit disk, that means that the absolute value of every entry of m is bounded above by one, then uh, the determinant of the matrix cannot exceed an absolute value n to the n over two. And this bound is met with equality if and only if m, m conjugate transpose is n times the identity. So I have the proof here, but uh, maybe if we have time later, I will go through it. Uh, so uh, if if a matrix meets that bound, and then it, it is called a Hadamard matrix or a complex Hadamard matrix. Uh, the reason why I add this complex here is because traditionally Hadamard matrix, the term is reserved for plus minus one matrices, but uh, the, the bound applies to any. Uh, complex matrices with uh, entries of modulus one, for example. So if uh, your matrix with entries of, of modulus one satisfies HH conjugate transpose uh, being N times the identity, then you call it a Hadamard matrix. Uh, this is the same as saying that the rows are, are perverse and orthogonal. Or um, since this equation uh, would also be satisfied by if we, we conjugate by H is the same as saying that the columns are uh, pairwise uh, orthogonal. So the study of Hadamard matrices goes back at least to Sylvester's paper, uh, 1867, uh, on inverse orthogonal matrices. But there he studied more generally type two matrices, which are matrices satisfying the equation H, H uh, entry-wise inverse transpose is N times the identity, right here we would just take the entry-wise uh, inverse of every element and then transpose it. So in particular, if the entries are of complex uh, norm one, then this coincides with the Hermitian transpose, the conjugate transpose. So an example of a Hadamard matrix is the Fourier matrix. So if you take uh, zeta n to be the a primitive nth root of unity, then uh, this matrix uh, created by uh, the ijth entry being uh, the nth primitive root of unity that we chose to the i times j, then this matrix uh, is a Hadamard matrix. And uh, more generally, if you had a elementary abelian group or uh, any finitely generated abelian group, um, the character table should give you an example of uh, a Hadamard matrix. So some concrete examples. Here you have a two by two example of a Fourier matrix. Here are the three by three example and a four by four example. And here minus the notes minus one, uh, omega to the cube, this is a primitive third root. And here i is just the imaginary number i squared is minus one. So notice that if we don't restrict any further the, the set of entries from where we pick uh, our matrix, then we can always achieve Hadamard's bound at every possible order, because the Fourier matrix is an example at every possible order, right? So the situation will be more interesting if we restrict the entries of the matrices that we consider, or if we work in a proper subalgebra of uh, the matrix matrices over C, or, or we consider both restrictions. So for example, if the entries of a Hadamard matrix is taken from plus or minus one, then you can only have orthogonality of rows if the order is one, two, or a multiple of four. Um, right, so this is uh, Hadamard's conjecture says that there exists a real Hadamard matrix of order for n for every n. And uh, I don't think that Hadamard specifically wrote this conjecture. Uh, but he did state in his uh, paper the Hadamard maximum determinant problem. 
which asks for every n greater or equal than one, what is the maximal determinant of an m times n matrix with entries in plus or minus one? So in particular, Hadamard matrices are maximal determinant matrices. But if our order is not a multiple of four, Hadamard matrices with entries plus minus one cannot exist. And it is interesting then to see uh, who posed the Hadamard conjecture. I'm not sure. I think that perhaps Paley was the first one to write it in print. But it seems to have been like around the literature before that. Um, there's a group of Italian mathematicians that worked on determinants in the uh, early 20th century, uh, late 19th century, and they seem to have um, implicitly worked with the Hadamard conjecture in a way, and other Irish and English uh, authors also did the same. Um, so yeah, some, some examples of maximal determinant matrices. Here we have them at uh, orders three, four, and five. And I want you to notice that this five by five example satisfies this matrix equation in which uh, the pairwise inner product of rows is one if they're different or five if they're the same, five because or, or plus or minus one entries. So this is a, a nice characterization of uh, maximal determinant matrices at um, uh, not multiple support orders, and uh, they satisfy an, a refined upper bound, which is called the Barbo bound, and that's what we're going to mostly focus on. So let me just give a couple of results first about real Hadamard matrices. Uh, we know them to exist at orders uh, powers of two. This is Sylvester's original construction uh, using Kronecker products. Then we have the Paley constructions, uh, type one and type two. Type two is, uh, it can be seen as a construction equivalent to the Paley type one, but in the complex, uh, in the complex case uh, with fourth roots of unity. And then you apply a morphism which blows up the dimension by two, and then that's why you get a multiple of two here. Then uh, these are different sets constructions, and there's twin, po twin prime power different sets, which gives you this. Um, this set of orders where Q and Q plus two are both uh, prime powers. Uh, and I think that uh, here uh, we know all values uh, of uh, four T, Hadamard matrices, uh, for all T less or equal than 250, except for 167, 179, and 223. These are the smallest open cases. And here I mentioned uh, Siberius and Cragen's asymptotic existence results which tells you that if you have an odd number, then there is some T naught such that a Hadamard matrix of order 2T times M exists for every T greater or equal than T naught. And the best known upper bound for T naught would be this logarithmic upper bound. If you could prove that T naught is two for every M, then um, you have proven Hadamard's conjecture. And uh, when it comes to the maximal determinant problem, this has been well studied in the plus minus one case. And, and here I, uh, I compile a couple of bounds that we have, upper bounds. So Hadamard's upper bound applies for every n, but it's not achievable in odd cases, for example, or uh, uh, cases n congruent to two modulo four. Then there is Barber bound. The Barber bound uh, applies for every n odd in the case of plus minus one matrices and it has this shape. Then Elish and shortly after Voitas independently uh, showed this bound, which applies to the case n congruent to two modulo four. Here we have um, that there are vanishing sums, but you cannot have, uh, you cannot have um, a Hadamard matrix. You cannot have more than, uh, well, the graph is by part type, right? So you cannot have more than, uh, three mutually orthogonal matrices. And then you have here uh, the Elish bound, which is a refinement of, how, of the Barba bound for, um, uh, for the case n congruent to three modulo four. The Barba bound can only be met if uh, n is congruent to one modulo four. 
So this is a strengthening that, uh, well, it has a more complicated form in the general case, but for n greater or equal than 63, it has this shape. And uh, there is no known examples that meet this bound, but um, it is known that uh, the first example that could meet, meet this bound would be of order at least about 500. I forgot the precise number. Um, so now let me talk to you about Butson type Hadamard matrices. Butson type Hadamard matrices are a generalization of the real Hadamard matrix case. And they are the Hadamard matrices with entries consistent of complex roots of unity. So BHNM is the notation for the set of Hadamard matrices of order N with entries in the nth roots. And here I have some couple of results. As we saw, BHNN, uh, there, there is a BHNN for every N. This is just a Fourier construction. Uh, Butson showed that there is a BH2PP for every prime P. And then if you just take Kronecker products, then you can see that if you have a BHN1M1 and a BHN2M2, then there is a BHN1 times N2, and then the root is the lowest common multiple of M1 and M2. And here there is uh, another general construction. This is not restricted to uh, BH matrices, but if you have a uh, Hadamard matrix of order H and H minus one is a prime power, then there is a BH H times H minus one M. So this construction was first stated by Scarpies at the end of the 19th century, uh, where the condition was that H minus one should be a prime. And then Djokovic in 2017 uh, extended res this result to uh, prime powers. Uh, however, I don't think they uh, considered this for Butson matrices, but this does work in general. It does. They, they considered it for plus minus one matrices, but this works in general for any Hadamard matrix. Um, so examples of BH uh, three matrices, you have one here at order three and here one at order six. This one is taken from uh, quadratic residues module five, and then you border them and you put ones on the, on the diagonal. So the Bible bound, uh, that I mentioned before applies more generally to complex matrices. And we have uh, that if you have a matrix of order N with entries of modulus one, if the off diagonal entries, oops, sorry, if the off diagonal entries of the gram matrix of M satisfy that their modulus is at least one, then the determinant, the absolute value of the determinant of M is less or equal in the square root of two n minus one times n minus one over n minus one over two. And this bound is met with equality if and only if the matrix M is monomially equivalent to a matrix B that satisfies B, B conjugate transpose is n minus one, the identity plus J. So that five by five example that we saw before is an example of a, uh, of a Barbon matrix. So the critical assumption here is that the absolute value of the of diagonal entries is at least one. And um, if you notice that for entries being roots of unity, the of diagonal entries, or well, every entry of uh, the gram matrix is a sum of M roots of unity. So here we would have, for example, that uh, the IJ entry is, uh, Zeta m to the e1 plus zeta m to the e2, and so on, where we have n terms and these ei's go from zero to m minus one. So we are interested when the absolute value is at least one. Uh, that's when uh, the, the Barber bound applies, at least in this shape. And this is the case where uh, the ring of integers of the cyclotomic a field, or let's say the integers appending the nth roots of unity, is a disc discrete subring of C. So a discrete subring of C is a subring of C where every element of the ring is isolated in the induced Euclidean topology uh, of the complex numbers. So this is equivalent to saying that zero is an isolated point, just because uh, with the group 
uh, sorry, with the ring uh, properties, you can translate everything to zero. And um, this is the same as having that the distance between any two points of the ring when you embed them in, in C uh, is at least one. So this is the condition that we need for uh, having the sum of any uh, uh, of n m words of unity to be at least one. So from Dirichlet's approximation theorem, one can show that if your subring R has three elements which are z linearly independent, then R is not a discrete subring. So that leaves you with just quadratic extensions. And um, so the, um, the ring of integers of the cyclotomic field, or just z adjoining uh, the m towards of unity, will be a discrete, a discrete subring of C if and only if m is 2, 3, 4, or 6. So 2 is sort of a degenerate case. In that case, uh, it's just the integers. But then here, these are the quadratic extensions that are also cyclotomic extensions. And all of these are discrete subrings. So here, the picture is that if you draw the lattice of, uh, of the m towards of unity, then you don't have accumulation points towards zero, right? So uh, the lattice for z uh, adjoin the third roots and six roots is the same, it's the hexagonal lattice. And for the fourth roots is this uh, square lattice. Um, so here, the barbell bound will apply. So it is interesting to then consider generalizations of the maximal determinant problem to these cases. Um, so in general, if you have, just the remark here, uh, if you have uh, a prime, a prime order of the, the roots of unity, then a BHNP will exist only if uh, P divides N, because that's the only type of uh, vanishing sum of roots of unity that you can have. Uh, notice that for any value N, this sum of all the nth roots of unity uh, always vanishes. You can see it because in the circle, everything is uh, having, let's say, if you look at it from the point of view of geometry, then the very center of an equidistant partition of the circle would be zero. Um, but for a composite case, then you can have uh, some, let's say, more non-trivial cancellations. For example, you can have a vanishing sum of seven, six roots uh, given in this way. Here you have the third roots of unity, so this vanishes it in itself. And then you add this vanishing sum of order four with second roots. And um, in fact, there is even a seven, uh, by, uh, seven by seven uh, Hadamard matrix in the six roots. And then for, the, for having upper bounds uh, of the determinant when there is no vanishing sums, if your ring is not discrete, then there is a weaker version of this barbell bound that will depend on this function, which is the minimum of the sum of all uh, m, uh, let, let's say, the mu n m will be the minimum of the sum of n m roots of unity, so in absolute value. So here we have uh, just uh, n terms. And um, in general, finding the value of this function or upper and lower bounds uh, seems to be very hard uh, for, uh, let's say, fixed values of n or m. But we have actually a very nice description of mu n5 in terms of Lucas numbers, which I'm just going to briefly mention. Uh, recall that the Lucas numbers are defined as uh, Fibonacci number n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci n num number n plus 1. Oops, sorry. Um, which is also equivalent to this formulation, where Fn is, here Fn is the nth Fibonacci number. So the sequence of Lucas numbers is given by 2, 1, 3, 4, 7, and so on. These also satisfy the Fibonacci recurrence. And the, twice the Lucas numbers are given here for reference. So this is the shape of, the, of this function of minimal values of sums. Uh, you can notice that incongruence classes module 5, this function is monotone. 
monotonely uh, decreasing uh, or non increasing, I should say. So the way this function behaves is that you are going to have a jump only when um, you achieve an, an order that is a Lucas number or twice a Lucas number. So I'm having here in blue the Lucas number orders and in red the twice Lucas number orders. So here you can see that, uh, for example, um, at orders three, four, you have one over phi, where phi is the golden ratio. Here at order four, you have one over phi squared. And then I'm going to stay monotone until I hit the next order in which I increase by um, a factor of one over phi to the some power. And you just have to be accounting on ln, for example, for the Lucas numbers, the blue part, it goes by one over phi, then one over phi squared, one over phi cube, one over phi fourth, and so on. It's, I hope that made sense. I think it's easier to see it in the picture than, uh, than writing the function explicitly. But anyway, um, we will go back now to uh, generalizations of the max step problem for uh, cases where the barbell bound actually applies in that form. So we will restrict our focus to two, three, four, or six for the nth roots. So just a remark that the most challenging case out of these seems to be m equals three. I would say that this is the case because for plus minus one matrices, you have the Paley construction, which gives you quite a lot of examples of Hadamard matrices, uh, whereas the Paley construction will not work for m equals three. And then uh, the fourth and sixth roots contain the second roots. So you have a lot of examples for real Hadamard matrices and maximal determinant examples in the real case that extend to the fourth and sixth roots case. Uh, historically, the case M equals four was considered before by Cohn in 1996. And he used the existence of the Turing morphism to establish a relationship between the maximal determinant problem of the, over the fourth roots and the maximal determinant problem over uh, the plus minus one entries. And um, so, yeah, the existence of the Turing morphism also makes the case M equals four uh, particularly nicer. So let me talk about barbell matrices in the plus minus one case. A matrix of order N with entries of unit norm is a barbell matrix, again, if B, B conjugate transpose, is n times the identity plus j n. j is the all ones matrix. So in which case the determinant achieves the barbell bound. So by inspecting the determinant, you can see that if you're in the real case, the left-hand side has to be an integer. So this uh, term in the square root, because n is odd, right? So this is fine. But this term better be a perfect square. So 2n minus 1 has to be a perfect square. And this is equivalent to saying that n is a sum of consecutive squares. And furthermore, if you had a, a Barbara matrix, j minus 2n, where n is a 0, 1 matrix with constant row sum, and this is the important uh, assumption, then b is Barba if and only if n is the incidence matrix of a symmetric to t squared plus t squared plus 1, uh, sorry. Uh, two t squared plus t plus one squared t squared t choose two this time. So yeah, so the the Barbara condition together with constant rosum already imposes some uh, some regularity here, some extra regularity, and uh, you can determine the parameters of the design. So designs with these parameters were claimed to exist by Wilson. And as far as I know, the first appearance in print was due to Brouwer. And he showed that there, is, that there exists a symmetric two Q squared plus Q plus one squared Q squared Q choose two design for every odd prime power Q. So this is the designs that we need. Just that uh, 
this construction only applies for uh, prime powers. Uh, so it is not fully resolved, let's say, um, when there is a barber matrix of uh, constant row sum. But we have uh, many, very many examples, and in particular, infinitely many orders where the barber uh, bound is achieved in the plus minus one case. So now the fourth roots case. If we, if a BHN4 exists, uh, that is a Hadamard matrix with entries in the fourth roots, then it is necessary that n is even. And this is just simply because we need to have uh, vanishing sums. So here, for example, we have some examples of uh, BHN4s. And the conjecture uh, due to Sibiri is that there is a BHN4 for all n even. And um, now, I will mention here the Turing morphism. So if you have a W to be a BHN4 matrix, then you can express it uniquely as A plus IB, where A and B are zero plus minus one matrices. This is simply taking the real and imaginary part, let's say. So if you construct this matrix, you obtain a real Hadamard matrix. And this is known as the Turing morphism. So in particular, the existence of this morphism tells you that uh, the Seabury conjecture or the conjecture on the existence of BHN4 matrices implies the Hadamard conjecture. Uh, now let me talk about um, uh, elish voitas matrices or EW matrices. These are matrices achieving the refinement of Hadamard uh, these are matrices whose determinant achieves the refinement of Hadamard's bound at orders two module four. So the gram matrix of such matrices satisfies this equation in which um, you have some blocks of, um, of size n over two, where uh, the blocks in the diagonal have n's and twos, and so ends on the diagonal and twos off the diagonal in the diagonal blocks, and then zeros everywhere else. And um, see, so, yeah, so this is what I mentioned before, sorry, that any maximal determinant matrix of order n congruent to two modulo four meeting the Elish with this bound will be equivalent, monomially equivalent to a matrix of this type. So, for n odd in the case of fourth roots, applying the true morphism gives us that the existence of a barber matrix of order n congruent to one modulo two over the fourth roots is equivalent to the existence of an elish voitas matrix of order two n, which is congruent to two modulo four, and is of skew type. Skew type means that it has the shape x, y, minus y, x. So, for this case of matrices congruent to two modulo four, we also have a, um, a construction that achieves this bound infinitely often, and it's due to spans. And it says that if Q is an odd prime power, then there is an EW matrix of this order. And it is furthermore of skew time. So this already leads to an infinite family of examples of barba matrices in the fourth roots of Binet. So just to sum up, uh, uh, we know that we have the, uh, the Seabury conjecture. So for even uh, cases we expect or we would expect to achieve the bound always, the Hammer bound always. And then when you are in a knot uh, order, then you have uh, a plus minus one example given by the Bauer construction that we mentioned before. And then we have the Spence construction, which is lifted to give you cases uh, when n is congruent to three modulo four. And uh, I just remark that the Barber bound in the fourth roots case is achieved only if um, n is the sum of two squares. Um, or no, not exactly. Uh, well, I, sorry, I take that back. I, I need to think about it. But I believe that um, 
if you uh, if you are interested later, I can tell you about when exactly what are the conditions for meeting the bubble bond in this case. Um, so that's for the fourth roots. As I mentioned, uh, the third roots seem to be the most challenging case, and this is the one where I uh, mostly focused in my in my research. And uh, well, again, uh, we are in a prime order case for the roots. So um, vanishing sums can only happen in multiples of three orders. So the, bar the Hadamard bound can only be met when n is a multiple of three. And here are some examples. And let me give you an overview of the results uh, that I have. So upper bounds, we have the Hadamard bound for multiples of three. Then there is the generalized Hadamard bound, um, Barba bound, sorry for uh, congru uh, cases congruent to one or two modulo three. This bound can only be achieved if n is congruent to one modulo three. And this right-hand side squared is a norm in the Eisenstein integers. So uh, lower bounds that I have is, um, well, um, whenever we can meet the Hadamard bound, for example, this is uh, the Watson construction. Uh, also, we have uh, the scarpius djokovic construction. And then we have for n congruent to 1 and 2 modulo 3, some infinite families that achieve at least 71% of the proper bound in both cases. So let me go through, through these. If there is a BHN3, then there is a matrix M over the third roots of order n squared plus 1 with determinant bounded below by n minus 1 to the n sorry, a minus one times n to the n squared. So this determinant achieves at least a fraction of one over the square root of two, which is roughly 71% of the Barba bound. So to prove this, uh, notice that if you have a complex Hadamard matrix of order n with constant rho sum, uh, letting m be this bordered matrix, you can see that the determinant of m is at least the square root of n minus one, times n to the n over two. So the way to, well, in particular, if you compare it to the Barber bound in the order n plus one, this shows you that the, the ratio approaches one over the square root of two. So to see this, let m be this border bordered matrix. And uh, if you comp compute the inner product uh, uh, with, sorry, if you compute the product with its conjugate transpose, you find that it has this shape where alpha is one plus s and s is the constant rho sum of h. Remember that we had an assumption of constant rho sum. So then this matrix that I reproduce here, uh, if we look at, the, at this other block decomposition, where we just took the two by two principal submatrix here, uh, we can see that this is equivalent by row operations if we subtract the second column, if we subtract from all columns except for the first, the second column, then we see that um, elementary row operations give you this equivalence. And now we can subtract every Let's say we can subtract every row from n minus some from two to n. Uh, we can subtract it from the second row. So another elementary row operation uh, will give you this. So now you know that the determinant of m squared is the product of these, uh, the determinants of these diagonal blocks, right? So the determinant squared is n to the n times two times n minus one, sorry, n plus one, minus the modulus of alpha squared. So if you let s be a plus bi, this modulus squared is just one plus two a plus s squared. So two a is two times the real part of s. And this real part of s is bounded above by the modulus of s, which is at the same time bounded above by square root of n, because the entries of m are uh, of uh, unit modulus. So this upper bound tells you 
that the determinant square is at least n to the n times this factor, which turns out to be square root of n minus one squared. So taking square root of root, the square roots, you find this uh, lower bound for the determinant. So we had the assumption of constant rho sum, but that assumption you can get for free if you have a BHNK. There's this construction of Bush that tells you that if you have a BHNK, then there is a BHN, BHN square K with constant rho sum. So applying that result, we find um, the original statement that we have here. That if there is a BHN3, then there will be a matrix of order n squared plus one with that lower bound of the determinant. And now for orders two modulo three, I have a construction that achieves also one over the square root of two of the Varba bound. And it works for every prime power uh, congruent to one modulo three. So for every prime power congruent to one modulo three, there will be a matrix of order Q plus one, which is two modulo three, over the third roots such that the um, absolute value of the determinant is at least this. So the way, the way you do it is uh, the, in, the, in the same way as the Paley construction. So let Z not be the set of cubes in the finite field of order Q, sorry, in the group of units of the finite field of order Q, and C1 and C2 cosets of Z not. So you will build a matrix M indexed by elements of FQ, where you let the diagonal to be zero, and M minus and M sub I minus J is uh, omega to the K if, sorry, this is a typo. M I J is omega to the K if I minus J is in the K coset of C naught. So this bordered matrix satisfies a, a conjugate transpose is Q times I Q plus one. So it's a, let's say generalized conference matrix. So the determinant is easily computed in this way. And then uh, computing, comparing with the barba bound at order Q plus one, you find that it also approaches one over the square root of two. So to give a particular example, if you take P equals seven, which is one modulo three, the cubes are one and minus one, uh, minus one being six modulo seven. And so uh, the cosets are three, four and two, five. So you can build this matrix, which is going to be circular because it's a prime order. And then bordering, you attain that lower bound on the determinant. So now let me tell you about some examples where you actually meet the bound. So if you have a matrix um, that has entries in the third roots, but it has only two different entries, so the way I write this is with uh, M being JV, let's say for V some order, plus omega minus one N, where N is a zero one matrix. This matrix M will satisfy the Barba equation if and only if N is the incidence matrix of a symmetric VK lambda design with lambda being K minus V minus one over three. So if you combine this equation with uh, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental equations for uh, symmetric designs, you obtain a Diophantin equation that only has two solutions. And this gives you only two examples. So you have the, the trivial design on four points, blocks of size three. Or, oops, sorry. So the complete graph. Uh, and then you have the projective plane of order two, which is an example of. Uh, at order seven. So these two are barba, uh, barba matrices for the third roots. And then uh, similarly, if you have a matrix now given with a constant row, a constant diagonal, and then omega and omega square in the diagonals, uh, in the off diagonal, sorry. And here A has constant row sum, 
then M satisfies the barba bound equation if and only if A is the incidence matrix of a strongly regular graph with parameters BK lambda mu, where lambda is mu minus one, and this is equal to K minus B minus one over three. So again, using um, th this equation here, and using the fact that, sorry, that this is a strongly regular graph, you can reduce this to a Diophantine equation, which is exactly the same as the one that we, uh, that we obtained for the, for the previous case. And it only has two solutions, and that is the Peterson graph and the Paley graph of order 13. Here are the Peterson graph, the Paley graph of order 13, and they give you these two examples at orders 10 and 13. So, um, that was mostly it. Now I just want to tell you a little bit about the status of the BHN3 existence and classification problem. As far as I, as I know it, it stands. So here I put numbers for the number of equivalence classes under monomial equivalence. These are taken from Lampio, Soloshi, and Ostergaard's paper. And uh, the BHN3's matrices, oops, sorry, are classified up until order 21. And as far as I know, the smallest open case is 24. And here are these uh, cases here, all orders are multiples of three. And these cases where you have non-existence, it's due to um, the term in an equation not being able to split as a norm in, uh, in the Eisenstein integers. Um, so most of these constructions here that I have that I don't have the classification for them are either prime powers of three or they're taken from uh, the Scarpi's Djokovic construction. And then the maximal determinant problem third roots as I uh, have it now looks like this. So, I have all barba bound, uh, all barba matrices up until 13. For order 16, um, the by considerations of the determinant, you can see that the barba bound cannot be met at order 16. So the next open case for the barba bound is order 19. And then we don't have a strengthened upper bound for uh, congruent uh, orders congruent to two modulo three. So it is. Um, a computational task, let's say, to prove that these matrices are maximal. There is a certain degree of confidence that the examples that I have here for eight and 11 are uh, maximal. For five, uh, I have a proof that it is maximal. And then here I have an interesting example at order 15 that is circulant, and it has a similar shape, the gram matrix as the EW matrices. But um, I do not have a proof that it would be maximal. Uh, this is also a case where uh, the Hanamar bound cannot be met. So here again, I have uh, some uh, summary of the um, uh, upper bound, the lower bounds that I have for the barba bound. And then let me finish with uh, the other cases for the BHN4 matrices. They're classified up, up until order 16. And as far as I know, the smallest open case is 70. And uh, here I put E for existence and H just to indicate that there's a Hadamard matrix, a real Hadamard matrix of that order. So most of these orders can be constructed from the Paley construction. Some of them, for example, 22 can be got from the Scarpius Djokovic construction because, for example, 12 exists and 11 is a prime power. So 22 should exist. And um, for BHN6, we have this situation in which we have these congruence classes here that do not have existence because there is no vanishing sums. But for the rest, the status seems to be that uh, it is mostly decided at least for small orders. 
there are some open cases at order 37, 43, and 46. And it is classified up until uh, order 14. Um, and yeah, and then the obstructions are of the same type as the ones that appeared in the third roots case. So that is all. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to either hear from your questions or if you want me, I can go through the proofs of the Barba bound or the Hadamard bound. Okay, thank you, Gilmar. Uh, so, is there any question for Gilmar? So can you can you show us the proof? <laughs> oh oh I see I see a lot of things in this chat. Oh yeah. Okay okay. Um, all right yeah for sure I can I can give you the proof of Hadamard's bound. Um, proof of Hadamard's bound. I took this one from Horn and Johnson. It is actually really nice. So we proved something. Let me first just go back to the Hadamard bound to remind ourselves. So we need to show that if you have an M by M matrix with entries from the complex unit disk, then the determinant is in absolute value bounded above by N to the N over two. And the equality is met if and only if rows are orthogonal. So we prove something stronger that if G is an Hermitian and positive definite matrix, then it's diagonal, sorry, then its determinant is going to be bounded above by the product of its diagonal entries. So if G is Hermitian and positive definite, then Sylvester's criterion tells you that its diagonal entries are real and positive. So if you call delta, this diagonal matrix consisting of the square root of uh, the diagonal entries of G, we can get this matrix C by multiplying by the inverse in the left and in the right. This is a symmetric operation, so it preserves the Hermitian property, and it's also positive definite. And now the property is that C has all diagonal entries being equal to 1, so the trace is n. And now if lambda 1 to lambda n are the eigenvalues of C, they're also real and positive by positive definiteness, then the arithmetic, ge arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality tells you that the determinant of C, which is the product of the eigenvalues, it's less or equal than the sum of the eigenvalues over n to the n. But this is the trace over n, and the trace is n, so this is 1. So the determinant of c is less or equal than 1. And uh, now, taking determinants in this uh, equation that we had for c, we see that the determinant of g is the determinant of delta squared times the determinant of c, which is less or equal than the determinant of delta squared and this is just the product of the diagonal entries of, of G. And this equality in the arithmetic geometric mean inequality uh, is an equality if and only if all eigenvalues are equal. So all eigenvalues should be one, and, and C is diagonalizable. This is equivalent to saying that C is the identity. Um, so we apply this to the gram matrix of M. So the gram matrix of M is Hermitian and positive definite. And now since uh, the entries of M are bounded above by one, then you know that the, of that, the diagonal entries of G are bounded above by N. So now we apply that and we see that the determinant of M squared in modulus is, which is the same as the determinant of G, 
is less or equal than n to the n. So you take square roots and you find the Fermat bound. And um, I don't know if I have, do you want me to go through the Fermat bound proof? Or do you have questions about that? Uh, I, I have a different question. Um, yeah. Do you know of, are, are there generalizations of the Turin morphism where you work you know, with something else, some other extension, and then translate yes. it to real Hadamards? Yes, there are several morphisms. There is an unreal morphism from BHN6 to real Hadamard matrices. Unreal means that it, it's a partial morphism. So it's only defined for matrices that do not have plus or minus ones. And in a paper, I have I have morphisms from quaternary unit Hadamard matrices, which were defined by Karagani, into real Hadamard matrices. So these are matrices which are in a extension of order four of the rationals. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my advisor has a paper which studies morphisms of Butson type matrices in certain generality, and I think. He claims that he told me once that he has a morphism from fifth roots to real matrices too, but uh, I never looked at it myself. So, but yeah, there's several morphisms in the literature. Yeah. 